You are listening to Draw 4 Podcast. Good tidings, and thanks for joining us. I am Joseph Dunlap, executive producer of Draw 4 Podcast, and a member of Team Manalink. I'm Chris Cooper, and I'm a member of Team Manalink. I'm Ashley Knox. I occasionally write for Team Manalink, and this is my first time on the podcast. I'm TJ Love. I'm a guest from the U.S., a college student. Welcome to Team Manalink as a guest, TJ. Always great Thank to you. have you on the podcast, and Ashley, welcome to the podcast, since you've been a part of the project for quite a while. This is our first time to actually get you on. Yeah. So we've got quite a few topics to talk about this week, and the first one is standard because it's a standard topic, ha. Huh. And TJ and I are going to go to Grand Prix Houston very soon at the end of this yes. month. I've been doing quite a bit of testing. Same. It's been a lot of trial and error. I've been trying multiple versions of my deck, and I think I've finally decided on the one I'm going to stick with because it's been I've, I've gotten first at my FNMs of like 15, 16 people three weeks in a row now. What deck are you currently running? Uh, Red Green Ramp. The, you know, play lots of little dudes like Sylvan Advocate and Hangerback Walker. And pretty much just try to stall the board until you play Nessus Pilgrimage and Explosive Vegetation trying to hit into Ugin, Ulamog, and World Breakers. I like how many different versions there are of Red Green Ramp right now. Because <clears throat> you've got the Mono Green version, the one that got second in the Star City Games tournament. And then there's your version, which is the Sylvan Advocate version. Are you running Nissa's Renewal? Um, I was originally running two, but I started looking at uh, Zendong Shan's list, and his was running the full playset of uh, Kozilex Returns. And I kind of decided that I didn't really like the full playset because the two damage was really only relevant to kill off like tokens and then uh, turn to Jace. Yeah, I found the same thing. The two damage is pretty negligible. If you could just discard it, that would even be better. I made like a couple of cuts here and there, but now I'm actually playing a full playset of Oath of Nyssa, which was, it's probably like the best correction enchantment the entire deck has, in my opinion. There's quite a few people um, actually running that. Yes, like, if you have Forest and Oath in your first hand, you can look at the top three, either find you a two-drop, or you can find another land 90% of the time. And my list does run a one of Chandra Flamecaller, just because, you know, profit, value, all the good wor- all the good magic words. The funny thing about this is that you and I saw the value in Eldrazi Ramp long before it became mainstream. Yeah, like I was saying, I was playing a version of... Uh, uh, he got, I believe, 11th at the open that the mono green version got second. And he was playing four main board wall breaker. And what he would do a lot of times was chain them with the sanctums. Mm-hmm. And he would just play stone rain for the entire game. And it was, it was probably one of the coolest things I've seen. But the best part about it is that the deck already had a really bad weakness against flyers. And he answers that. Kills pretty much everything that flies in the format. Just what's a quick aside on Hangerback Walker and Jace in a format with the Reflector Mage. I think that the existence of that card makes them a little bit worse, so I think you were, you moving away from them now could be quite good. Yeah, that's actually what I saw in testing. I looked through my notes. I've been writing very extensive notes because I'm a team of one right now. I noticed every time Hangerback Walker hit the field, I never got Thopters. And I didn't expect that. But post-OGW, every time I cast Hangerback... I don't get Thopters. Um, so I had the article go up on manleak.com last week. It was another deck tech for old school magic, this time focusing on a reanimator strategy. What is old school magic? So old school magic is a format that's been created by a group of guys primarily in Sweden, but it's spread kind of throughout Europe and the US now, uh, that takes in uh, all the really old sets. You've got your Alpha, Beta, Unlimited, Arabian Nights, Antiquities, the Dark, and Legends. It's pretty much like an anti-modern. <laughs> yeah, it's it's basically the oldest stuff you can get. The UK group is starting to allow some reprints, so you can have things like Chronicles and revised cards and maybe the old 4th edition card. But like the original Swedish group, it's strictly those that set of seven sets. Yeah, Using revised cards is seen as using proxies. So yeah, you, you've got to have your proper unlimited jewel lands. You've got to shell out for the expensive stuff for them. So it's seen as a little bit elitist, but there are a lot of people trying to make it a little bit more accessible. Most of the time, I am doing that. But this deck's just a little bit 
less accessible in terms of some of the money you're looking at. So I've, I've kind of been playing around with the format, looking at a lot of the decks, and up to now, there are a lot of quite grindy control decks or creature-based aggro decks, but there's quite a dearth of combo decks past your Underworld Dreams decks, which, for those of you who don't know, Underworld Dreams is an enchantment for black, 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 that whenever an opponent draws a card, it deals one damage to them. Ouch. Yeah, and when you've got cards like Time Twister and Wheel of Fortune in the format, suddenly it's three mana for seven damage to your opponent. Even Winds of Change is like a mini Wheel of Fortune. Actually targeting your opponent with Ancestral Recall becomes a real thing in this format. It's like you're playing an extra lightning bolt for blue. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that's the only real combo deck in the format. I wanted to create a new combo deck, uh, the Reanimator deck. So your basic aim of the deck is to get one of the two Elder Dragons that are in the deck. You've got Nickel Bolas and Chromium as four ofs into the graveyard, at which point either Resurrection or Animate Dead can bring them back. They're both difficult threats to deal with. Uh, neither Lightning Bolt nor Terror deal with either. Out of the main removal spells in this format, you're looking at Swords to Plowshares as probably being the best way of dealing with them. Blocking them doesn't really work. They're 7-7 seven, seven Flyers, which also means they get over Moat and Island Sanctuary. You're basically looking at Icy Manipulator, Chaos Orb, as I said, Swords to Plowshares, Wrath of God. Beyond that, there's not really a good way of dealing with them. It's a great fun format. I would urge you guys to check it out. I've written a couple of other articles on Old School. We'll be sure and link your most recent article. I had the pleasure of editing that one. That was a lot of fun to read. <laughs> and we'll also link your author page as well as mine and Ashley's so that people can go and see what we've been up to. Anything else before the lightning round, folks? No, no I'm ready to go with that. All right. TJ and Ashley, bring us into the lightning round. Okay, we're okay. talking about modern. Yeah, we're... We're all disappointed. I think that's a good way to start. No, I'm kidding. But um, probably one of the biggest things that we probably should talk about is what do you think is the best way to fix the modern format with this Eldrazi aggro deck going around? That is the community question. Me personally, I think some unbannings would be great, but I think the format's going to self-regulate. With the players that actually care about the game, I, I think they're just people are going to play what they play and they're going to play it well, and that's going to what's going to really matter. We've got a couple of GPs coming up. We'll see a completely different meta game there. It was a little bit rusty for me because when I played last weekend, there was I, I did a lot of testing and all kinds of stuff for this this GP, and I was not expecting this Eldrazi deck to show up. And I was playing Grixis Delver, so at the same time, I was like, well, I'm not really coming to win. I'm coming to just see what the format's like now because it's been a while since I've played at a modern event. Well, when I got matched up against that deck, rounds one and two, and I believe four. I was a little heartbroken because I literally only won one game against that deck, and that's because I curved off on the turn one Delver and the turn two Storm Chaser Mage after flipping a Delver into... Yeah, I can't remember, but it was a perfect curve. I think I just ended up chaining Gurmag Anglers after that. The real issue with the deck is... like, And I had a really long discussion with Jeff Hoogland and um, Chris Van Meter the other day about this whole modern thing and literally uh Jeff Hoogland was even threatening to just stop playing modern until until something as such as Ivugan or uh Eldrazi Temple gets banned and what I was kind of saying is yes I kind of agree with that I w- probably wouldn't stop playing modern and Jeff Hoogland was like I'll probably just try to find some way around all of the the extra threats that the deck plays and so I, I'm pre- he's been playing like any deck that runs in snaring bridge that's pretty much his, been his thing for the past 24 hours. Well, that's the answer right there. They they can't attack. They get their thought knots here on turn two, and you can't play your ensnaring bridge. <laughs> yeah, and that that's the really that's rough the part problem. about the whole, yeah. that's the whole deck right there. And I think that's not. I don't think the answer is to ban thought knots here or no. Ayavugan because Ayavugan is not is. I mean, yes, it's powerful, but it's not like a key piece to the deck. I think the main key piece that needs to get some attention is Eldrazi Temple. Possibly. But, but the thing is, like, the horrible part about the deck is when I was watching it on the Pro Tour, they had, like, three Drowner of Hopes on the board. And, like, the deck, that, of course, for Modern, that the f- three five fives is already, you know, nuts unless it's Tarmogoyf, you know. But I think the probably the most ridiculous part about it was that even though the blue, like, I was watching him play against a Blue Moon deck, even though the Blue Moon deck was literally able to clear his board at the end of his own turn, the Eldorazi deck straight up, 
replayed an entire board state worth of cards. Which two of had built-in hand stripping, and the other ones just made more scions for more board presence. Which for modern, I think is a little bit much. Well, Chris and yeah, I, I mean, uh, Tom, have Tom oh. long been the standard for efficient beaters, and it's kind of become the poster child of modern. Is that this is what's acceptable for two mana, uh, or is an acceptable to turn two play? And I think you're going to say the same thing, weren't you, Joseph? That we were talking about this before we started recording, and how Tom Goyf has just been completely outclassed as a turn two play by playing Tom Goyf crossed with a Vendillion click, basically, which is yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. I can play as Tom Goyf on turn two and have it maybe be a two three, or I can play the Thought Knots here on turn two and have it as a four four, or if I'm lucky, uh, is it Reality Smasher, the five five mm-hmm. pace? Yes. Whatever it is. So yeah. having already played, yeah, having already played out some free Eldrazi mimics on turn one and smashing for, uh, yeah, doesn't make think about I it. think the ridiculous this is, part this, is this that... is vintage power level. Yes, and what I think is ridiculous about it is before the Eldrazi decks came to light and before the Splinter Twin Bannings, like, honestly, like, a 5-drop, like, Reality Smasher, like, even even 5 mana for anything is rough unless you're playing Urzatron. But I think what was a little bit weird about it was just, like, they're able to cast the higher-end threats that most modern decks don't get to till late game on turn 2, and they have built-in hand manipulation. Which is just a little bit... I think that's just probably the part that I don't really care for. I think Thought Not Steer is probably what makes that deck. And I think that's probably how it's going to be until they do something about Eldorazi Temple or, you know, Eye of Ugin, maybe. I really don't see them getting rid of Eye of Ugin because of the fact that A, they just reprinted it as an expedition. And B, with the fact that it's one of the better lands in Urzatron... Now, when I say better lands, like, it's not necessary. Like, a lot of Tron players saying they've already got rid of it because, you know, they don't play Emrakul anymore. They don't realize that it finds Oolongs. And that's probably the only real reason why you play that card is because it's the thing that they use to tutor for it's removal. It's any colorless creature, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's any colorless... Yeah, it's any colorless creature, so they can find Worm Coil Engines yeah, as well. Yeah, it can find Worm Coil Engines, yeah. But I think, and honestly, without Ivogan, I really think that deck just takes a huge beating. Whereas, and, and the thing is, Green Red Tron has very little interaction with the board, where at supposed to, you know, because they try to just kind of stay on their own side of the board and do their own thing, trying to get their Urza lands on. And, you know, py- Pyroclasm's probably the real board state control that they have but until they hit Karn. But, uh, and, you know, they're just they're really not too aggressive about anything unless they're just going straight into, you know, tower expedition map go and then trying to find the other two pieces by turn two or three yeah personally i think the the real problem with it is just the speed of the manner it can generate and lo- looking at the deck as a vintage player i can see eye of ugin being more powerful in that deck than mishra's workshop is in vintage and i can see me my if i was playing vintage i would almost be more scared of coming up against this Eldrazi deck with the speed and the resilience that it can put out, and the threat density that it can generate with Eye of Ugin than I am of Mishra's Workshop decks. It's, it just seems that much of a powerful enabler. You know, if, it's, if you've got an Urborg house, it is literally generating an extra mana there from that. So you, you have got your build your own Mishra's Workshop with the upside of being able to choose to up a creature at some point, and just every turn throwing out an additional creature. Yeah, as, as a vintage player... That's something that really looks scary to me. And playing modern now is getting to the stage where, yeah, I, Brian Tibler said on Twitter, yeah, welcome to Pro Tour Vintage. You've got six workshop decks and a mox deck in the final because you got your affinity, uh, sorry, in the top eight because you got your affinity deck with its mox opals and, yeah, their fast mana there. I think it's the problem with modern at the minute is the speed of the mana and the way it can generate mana so quickly. If wizards want modern to be a true turn four format, then they need to get rid of this fast mana. But Tron is a deck that I can see them not being sad about nerfing by killing Eye of Ugin at the same time. Because then, yeah, in the last few bannings, we'd have had Splinter Twin go, Tron go. It would open the door up to being a lot more of a junk-based format, but maybe something like Jace could then be unbanned yes. as a card to combat that. Because I think the blue, 
I blue is underpowered in modern right now. It really is. I think. <laughs> now I yeah. will say I did enjoy seeing the blue moon decks come back. That was that was refreshing. Yeah, no, that that is cool. They did look fun. And, and blood moon's another card I have an issue with. That's 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 a topic for another day. Yeah, I think the main problem with the deck is it just pushes out archetypes. There's literally no reason to play allies, merfolk, burn, zoo, because there's a better, more efficient aggro deck where you can just turn five fives against your opponent. You don't need to mess around with, you know, bolt five yourself twice to have a free free and cattle. Five fives that force you to two for one at that. Yeah. I've heard people try and get cute saying they want to play like Wilt Leaf and Luxton Smiter, but I don't even think that's the answer. You know, because you just discarded a guy what's still smaller than that guy. I have quite a bit I wanted to say about this, because we were, we were talking about this before we recorded as well. The point that the mana base is kind of the issue at the moment. When Colorless Matters, they, they have to take stock of what they've printed prior to Colorless Matters and realize when you've got 12 cards in a deck that are Colorless Enablers, and previously that didn't really matter, it was just like, you know, basically a weak soul ring. Now you've got all these cards that have Carlos in the cost, and you've got people playing basically full play sets of four cards printed from Oath of the Gatewatch with Carlos in the cost, not just Carlos, but Carlos in the casting cost. They need to take stock and quit getting tunnel visioned into the biodome of what they're creating for standard. And so they sort of broke modern mm. without meaning to. Eye of Ugin is a worthy target for a ban because as the commentators at the Pro Tour kept saying over and over, wow, they just got six mana off of Eye of Ugin, and it never even tapped. But then so is Eldrazi Temple, because it also helps with the activated abilities of things. But, I mean, there's plenty of other things that are kind of a problem. Even if you ban one of those cards, you still have Thought Not Seer. You still have Endless One. Endless One is a Tarmogoyf for whatever turn you're on. You talk about Tarmogoyf being a 3-4 on turn 2. Well, how about an Endless One that's a 6-6 six, six or a 7-7? Seven, seven? What about the problem of Eye of Ugin enabling all the Eldrazi Mimics to become Reality Smashers on turn 2? That's kind of a problem as well. Simeon Spirit Guide isn't the problem. That's always been a pretty decent card. But as you look, the price of all these enablers has skyrocketed, whereas all the competition such as Kiki Jiki, have plummeted. Not a reference to the card plummet. So there's a lot of angles to this that I don't think Wizards even saw coming. Because when you look at their What to Expect for the Pro Tour article, you don't even see the Eldrazi is on their radar. However, the pros have it on their radar because they need a good, linear, consistent deck. Because, you know, if you start off with draft, you need to get in the top seed with draft. So that's why you have in the top eight players like LSV who are really talented draft players. But then you look at the top eight decks in Modern, it's not the same thing as the top eight that made it through drafting and constructed for the entire Pro Tour. You look at the top eight in Modern, and it's a little bit more spread out. But it's because it's players who know those decks really well, and they know the format, but they're not maybe as good at draft as players like Luis Scott Vargas, who just falls back on the more consistent linear decks. But decks, for example, like Sam Black's Lantern, got, I think, 10th place overall in Modern, got 24 points. So it's a little bit disproportionate. When you look at the top 8 of a Pro Tour, it's not exactly representative of the top 8 decks. When you say consistent decks, like it was definitely not... There was no shortage of the Eldorazi deck, the Pro Tour, or the Regionals for SCG. My whole summarization of that topic is if Wizards was trying to ban Splinter Twin to make the format more diverse, they failed. Well, I mean, Chris and I have our suspicions after the conversation we had last episode. Yeah, and uh, we discussed last time that uh, we felt that Wizards were trying to ban Splinter Twin to broaden the field, to allow other decks to come through, and allow the big mana decks, and named Tron specifically, as well as the Adrazi deck, uh, to shine. But it would allow the cards from the Gatewatch they were printing to get a chance to have a chance to shine they'd be able to possibly play these colorless decks with wastes and all kinds of cards. It would mean that the sets that are currently in print, the sets that they're trying to sell, would be showcased that little bit more. But instead, they've almost... It's, it's almost quite fitting that the affinity decks are in the top eight with them because they've almost created a new affinity-type problem in that they've got a deck which is nigh unbeatable unless you're playing that deck or a deck to hate it. Well, ultimately, what Ashley said is probably going to be the case. Because you can't ban 
a deck comprised almost entirely of cards you just printed. That's just not smart. Oh, no. Just like what TJ no. said, which is you also can't ban a land that just got an expedition, even though that is, to me, the best target, I of Ugin. Splinter Twin was recently reprinted in the Masters 2. Well, Eye of Ugin was also reprinted in that, was it not? And Aldrazi Temple. So these are both yeah. both cards that Wizards have obviously had on their radar as we're actually going to need to make sure these cards are prevalent in circulation. I've never seen an expansion of Magic infect so many formats out of a second, no. like a second expansion. Battle for Zendikar was like, you know, pretty cool. But like, has anyone ever noticed that like in the Theros block, in the Innistrad block, in every block we've played since Lorwyn even, the second set of every block has been rather disappointing. Like, especially like in the Theros block, like Born of the Gods, that was really like it wasn't a fun draft format. It didn't really impact. The only format that it impacted even in the slightest was Legacy for Death and Taxes because they got Bremas. He's not even run that much anymore. I would slightly beg to differ there in that New Phyrexia had Mental Misstep in it, um, uh, okay, which was a small fair. set, and World Wake had both Jason Mind Sculptor and Stoneforge Mystic in it. Oh yeah. Okay. So th- there there are some powerful sets around. Well, if we're talking uh, about cards sets. from one set that both got banned, you could also talk about Treasure Cruise and they were both large sets. Dig through time, so that was cons, that was cons and attack, yeah. that was another situation where they just weren't thinking about the eternal formats. So it's, it's, it's a fair point that the Eldrazi are balanced within standard because they don't have the insane land base. But once you put them in modern, there's unintended consequences of colorless matters with all these lands where it's like, uh, I mean, it's okay. You can have the two mana because it doesn't matter. But now it matters. So Yeah, and those cards were designed for Ulamog's Crusher and you know, the original Ulamog, Spawnsire of Ulamog, Hand of Emrakul, all, all these cards which are uh, 8, 9, 10, 11 mana. Not your, you know, three mana guys that suddenly now cost one mana. The, the, the fact they've got a guy that's free to play off of it is insane. Well, ultimately, I agree with what Ashley has said because we all agree it's it's uh it's going to be difficult for them to ban pretty much anything involved because it's either new cards or freshly reprinted cards. If they want to ban, they will ban. But I think Ashley is correct in assuming the format will just adjust. And ultimately, the reason that there was such a problem this weekend is because nobody saw it coming, except those who thought, you know what, Eldrazi looks good, no one will see it coming, I'll play it, and then everyone's playing it, you know. So I think what will happen is Eldrazi players are punished for even playing Eldrazi, and then the format will just sort of balance itself. Hopefully that's what happens. If it doesn't, that's the point where Wizards has to step in, but I don't think they're going to step in until people have a chance to react. See, I think the deck wouldn't be so overpowered if it wasn't for the mana base, and I really think... This is just my personal opinion, of course. But I think getting rid of Eldorazi Temple for Modern, I think that's probably my best answer. Comes a few things. Um, I've heard people talk about Living End, which I'll come back to in a minute. But I think a Merfolk deck, because you have Seas, seas Claim at 1 mana, and then Spreading Seas at 2, that could be really destructive as well if you're like a Favile plan. You, you can also pressure quite well. Um, it would definitely just have to be the 8 Seas version with... Probably Stony Silence on the board for some of the like Affinity and Tron. But I've heard a lot of people talking about Living End at the minute. So you're just using your Living End as a three mana wrath and playing out your five, six for seven when you hit seven mana. And Beast of Fin to be able to damage their mana base as well while you're trying to develop. Yeah. I think there's game to it. I've heard about it and on the on paper it sounds dreadful, but I've heard it from a couple of good sources that it is actually a good matchup in favour of Living End. And I for one welcome Living End. <laughs> As a Consummate Fairies player. I, for one, welcome our living end overlords. Yeah, much more than these Eldrazi ones. Yeah, in place of these Eldrazi ones. So that is the community question for all of you listening. What do you think is the best way to fix the modern format? We look forward to hearing from you. You've got our answer. Ashley's is play eight spreading seas. And everyone else seems to agree. Probably the mana base is the problem. So we want to hear from you. Comments on Mana Leak or on YouTube. If you're on iTunes, then come and find us at metalink.com. Quite a few people listening to us on iTunes these days, which is exciting to hear. We want to hear from you. We're on twitter.com slash player4podcast at the moment, and you can also find us on metalink.com slash mtguk. Everyone, say your farewells before we wrap up. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me on. It's good talking to you guys about the modern format. It was good to get into the, the heated discussion that is the Eldorazi aggro deck, and uh, as always, it was good talking to you guys.
Thanks for listening, everyone. It's uh, been a good discussion. I'll see you again next time. And this is Joseph Dunlap signing off. This has been Draw4 Podcast. Until next time, we wish you good fortune, and may you draw well.